Okay, everybody, uh, good evening and uh, welcome to the Engineers Ireland Donegal Region uh, com Committee and uh, the, the event, the CPD event that uh, Vincent Bradley um, from McCloy Consulting has very, very kindly offered offered up to us. Um, so Vincent's uh, so he's been plenty, plenty of experience um, with uh, with McCloy Consulting and, and before that as well. Um, and uh, Vincent's going to talk about sort of the, the more natural ways to deal with flood uh, flood problems uh, in the initial area. So, uh, so there's 60, 69 registered for the event. We're, we're going to have a Q&A at the end. So I would ask anybody to place their questions in the chat box and they'll, they'll be addressed at the end. So. Uh, with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to Vincent. And uh, Vincent, do you want to take it away? No problem. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So there's the. This is just a quick agenda for this evening's presentation. Um, I introduce the myself as speaker and our contributor. Uh, we've got a few slides from the Anishon Rivers Trust, who were the client on this job. Uh, the main presentation then will be by myself from McCloy Consultant as a flood consultant on this job. Uh, we'll have a Q&A session and then some closing statements. Uh, so myself, I'm Vincent Bradley, uh, a project engineer with McCloy Consultant based in Derry here. Um, and I'd like to say thanks to Dr. Trish Murphy, who is the project officer with the Initial and Rivers Trust. And she was our client on this project. So we'll have a few slides now from uh, the Rivers Trust. Okay, sorry. Uh, so yeah, the Trust is an environmental charity that aims to protect, store and improve the rivers and natural water bodies of the Anishon Peninsula. Uh, the Trust evolved from a local community group that works both for the benefit of the community and for the environment. The main aims of the trust are to advance the education of the public or any other body in understanding rivers, river corridors, catchments, including fauna, flora, biodiversity, economic or social activity, and river catchment management, uh, and also the need for and the benefits of conservation, protection, uh, rehabilitation and improvement of aquatic environment. So the floods in the Northwest in the summer of 2017 were the catalyst for this project. Um, I'm sure everybody remembers the NHL Peninsula in particular was hit very hard by these floods. Um, you can see the images there on Trisha's slides that the damage from the floods was extensive. Um, several bridges, roads, businesses and homes were completely destroyed. So after the flood, the Trust spent over three years investigating nature-based solutions and increasing their knowledge of hydromorphology and natural flood management. In February 2018, they had Slow the Flow, a public awareness event on the benefits of using nature-based solutions. Uh, following that, in September, they had Restoring Rivers, uh, Flood Management and Eco-Hydromorphology presentation on river enhancement works and the importance of understanding hydromorphology. In October 18, then, Woodlands for Water was a presentation on the use of trees and ripery and planting in flood management. And from November 18th through to October 19th, the NHO and River Guardians program, which was leader funded, engaged volunteers in learning more about the understanding and monitoring of rivers. Following these awareness raising campaigns, a scoping study was commissioned by the Trust uh, was funded by OPW, and this report identified six catchments where the natural water retention measures could be implemented. The trust then secured funding from multiple sources to allow the construction of natural water retention measures in the catchments of Clomani. So as said, the trust secured 
135,000 euro for this pilot scheme to implement nature-based solutions. The deliverables for the project were to implement and catalog a suite of these measures in the Clamani area, to create a monitoring regime for the measures to evaluate their effectiveness over time, this being managed long-term by the trust themselves, to provide opportunities for the local community to engage meaningfully in the catchment scale project with experts and agencies, to provide opportunities to engage in rivers and gain transferable skills, to provide valuable advice and knowledge to riparian landowners, to increase knowledge and awareness of flooding, land use and management issues within the local community, to build the capacity within the trust and community groups, and to provide river habitat enhancement and restoration with subsequent positive impact on in-stream and riparian biodiversity, improve water quality as a result of reduced sedimentation in channel. So moving on now to uh, the main presentation from ourselves, how we were involved as flood consultant. Uh, we were appointed through an open tender process to provide advice and designs to the Anishon Rivers Trust. So here we have the stages of the project from concept through to construction of natural water retention measures on site. Uh, and over the next few slides, I'll detail what each of these stages entailed. So we began with our death study. The Finnish Own Rivers Trust provided us with background information package on the project. Uh, this was in the form of reports, uh, maps, like the one shown on the left-hand side of the slide there. Uh, and various QGIS ship files. We uh, created a, um, a uh, heat map using the highest resolution DTM available uh, for the catchments in and around Guamani to identify areas with uh, suitable topography. Uh, a snip of the heat map can be seen on the top right hand side of the slide there. So what we were looking for was areas with slopes less than 15% uh, gradient. These are considered the most favorable for introducing natural flood measures. So the red areas on the heat map there are the steeper sections, steeper parts of the catchment with the green being the flatter, and that's the areas that we were trying to find. Unfortunately, uh, Two meter radar was only available for the lower catchment reaches and around Clamani itself. Um, so we had to make do with the 25 meter in the upper reaches of the catchment. This is where uh, natural flood measures are better suited. Uh, in addition, then we also consulted with OPW flood mapping to identify areas which are already at risk from flooding in order to, in order to avoid these areas. Stakeholder engagement then began with the local Klamani community themselves. Um, due to COVID restrictions, our first public consultation was a virtual Zoom meeting on the 29th of April. And this was to discuss uh, the aims of the project with local people. Uh, when restrictions were eased, we were able to hold a publicly distanced public consultation in the Clomani Community Centre on the 29th of July. Uh, you can see the picture there at the top right. That's um, myself at the meeting, just discussing the project with members of the public. This was great because it gave us a face-to-face -face opportunity to discuss our pro progress to date, to explain our approach to flood management, in particular with this scheme. Uh, and to answer any questions that they had, um, it's worthwhile to note at this stage of the scheme, we've been in contact with over 200 people within the Clamani area. Uh, in addition then, during this time, the Rivers Trust themselves have produced and distributed various literature, leaflets, posters, etc. And these were to inform and advise the local community of the project of its progress, 
And these were made available to the public through the community center itself, uh, through local shops, uh, online, through the trust website and their Facebook page. The stakeholder engagement also involved working uh, with the Office of Public Works. Uh, we engaged with Connor Galvin. Connor works in OPW's flood risk management, climate adapt adaptation and strategic assessment department. Uh, definitely needs to catch your title, I think that one. <laughs> and uh, Chair Cafferty, who is OPW's flood relief engineer for Donegal. Chair advised that under the requirements of the section 47, or an application can be exempted under part 1C. So what this uh, required us to do was obtain written consents from all riparian landowners where natural flood measures would potentially be constructed. Uh, we also agreed with the OPW at this stage that there would be no out of bank storage due to the presence of our proposed measures. Uh, as I said, COVID uh, restrictions meant that site visits weren't initially possible. However, when restrictions were eased, uh, part of April to level four, uh, we, were, we were able to get up to Clamani and get some boots on the ground and have a look around. The trust issued myself and my colleague, Philip Duffy, with permission to travel letters. Uh, you can see one of those on the left there. Um, these were issued under the essential services, professional, scientific and technical activities as defined in the Health Act. So following our initial site visits, um, conversations with Mark Davenport, who is the Inishon Rivers Trust Land Liaison Officer, and with local landowners themselves, uh, we decided the best approach would be to concentrate our efforts in the Ballyhallan and the Ballyhocarney River catchment. Uh, the map there on the top right of the slide is some of the areas we had identified from the desktop study that we went out to visit. And the photograph on the bottom right was uh, it's a picture from the interview that Philip gave to uh, a film crew, which was another stipulation of, for the funding attached to this project that the trust had produced a series of videos documenting the progress. So with uh, our landowner permission secured, we visited each of the sites to walk along the rivers uh, in order to assess the potential for installing natural flood measures and what type of retention measures could be installed based on our experience of what suits the type of water course on site, the topography from delivering similar schemes across the UK. Uh, while we were out, we also took measurements of the channel. We recorded observations of the immediate catchment, including assessment for flood risk. So if any of the sites that we'd find on the desktop study where the construction of a natural water retention measure would pose risk to any adjacent property. It was just admitted from the project immediately. Uh, and while we were on site, this gave us an opportunity then to discuss with the landowner, you know, what potential measures we were thinking of and to answer any questions they had on our proposals and how it would affect and impact them. On site, Came clear that the topography varied quite a bit. We found a majority of the water courses to be incised and very steep, with limited opportunities for any out of channel storage. At this stage of the project, we also completed our design and risk assessments, uh, a preliminary health and safety plan, uh, in our role as project supervisor for a design process. And we also engaged with other stakeholders, so the likes of Inland Fisheries Ireland, the National Parks and Wildlife Service, 
and Donegal County Council themselves, uh, we found that there were no other consents required for our proposals. So with our site selected, we began work on the design of our measures. Uh, we started off with flow estimation for the water courses. Uh, we did this using the ADAS 345 method, the FSU statistical method. Uh, you can see a snip of one of the catchment descriptors there at the top right of the screen. And the IOH 124 flooded estimation on small catchments. The catchment information was benchmarked using our QGIS info to the size of the upstream catchments for the proposed sites and our site observations. Uh, we used a catchment analysis tool through QGIS to estimate the upper catchments from our specific proposed locations for NFM. Uh, now, those are the catchment descriptors follow uh, in conjunction with site observations then allowed us to uh, estimate flow depths for 50% and 1% AEP events. Uh, this then allowed, provided an opportunity to determine which uh, natural water retention measures would be best suited for the arrangement of in channel structures. The opportunities identified for natural water retention measures were the rivers, as I said, we observed them to be significantly incised and to comply with OPW's request that we only had in channel storage, uh, we decided to use leaky wooded dams. Uh, we used a variety of guidance and case studies to select the type of leaky wooden dams. A selection of that guidance is shown on the slide there on the left. We also, in addition to work on the water courses, identified other sites where the trust could implement gully stuffing and check dams to slow the flow of uh, surface runoff waters and artificial drainage channels within the catchment, which all uh, discharge to the water courses. Constraints to the project included a resistance to outer channel storage, uh, not just from OPW, but landowners were concerned that they would lose productivity of lands due to periodic flooding. Uh, the channels themselves being steeper, and so the storage behind the dams was then reduced. Uh, we also found large areas of lands in the upper regions of the catchments have been drained to increase productivity. This has the knock-on effect of sharpening the hydrograph of the adjacent rivers. Unfortunately, it was not possible to address this in the timeframe of this project. However, it's worth noting that the Inishon Rivers Trust continues to liaise with landowners on this issue. We also find uh, from our site visits that the common edge lands in the upper catchments were identified to have significant potential. Uh, just in case anybody's not aware, common edge lands are lands which have multiple claimants. So some of these lands could have three or four fellas claiming ownership. Some of them we were told it was upwards of 25 to 30 people. So um, again, just due to the time constraints of this project, these lands had to be discounted as we couldn't have secured all the landowner permissions within the time frame. So, as I said, our measures were leaky dams. These are three different types of leaky dams on the slide there. The wedge log type on the left, so this is just uh, tree trunks fixed in between up and downstream strainer posts across the water course. The leaky board type on the top right is rough sawn timber planks, essentially fixed to a downstream strainer post. 
And then on the bottom right there is the natural type dam, which is simply just a hinged rippery and tree. So basically just nick the trunk with a chainsaw and let the tree fall across the water course. These types of dams were selected as we wanted them to be very robust to ensure the landowner buy-in. Uh, all the dams were designed in accordance with the guidance as mentioned. Uh, these dams should be installed in a minimum of three and they should be perpendicular to the water flow. However, to maximize impact on this scheme, we increased the number of dams on the steeper water courses to maximize that uh, in-channel storage. The distance between the dams is normally set at seven times the channel width, and the logs are embedded into the banks in line with the guidance. The length of these logs should be one and a half times the channel width. The reason for this is that in the event of a dam failure, this reduces their mobility within the water course. So they're easily recovered and less likely to damage a downstream dam or block any downstream structures. The base flow of the channel is maintained underneath the dam. You can see there in the photographs that the first log or the first plank is kept roughly about 250 to 300 mil above the top water level. This allows fish passage. Now, when we met the trust on site, they informed us that they uh, regularly observe fish in the upper reaches of the catchment. So it was critical that our measures maintained and allowed fish migration and spawning in their natural habitats. Uh, the leaky wooden dam is never an impermeable structure. So the fact that water can leak in between the logs and between the planks, uh, this reduces the, the pressure buildup behind it from floodwaters and reduces the risk of a blowout. Uh, in accordance with the guidance, and again, we had to avoid installing measures on meanders or at tributary confluences. We had to avoid rivers with a gradient exceeding 30 degrees. And as mentioned, um, in in case of a failure of a dam, we had to stay 30 meters upstream of any bridges or culverts to avoid potential blockage. So once we had our signed land agreements and our easement permissions obtained, we started work on the detailed design to allow the construction of the dams. The landowner permissions that we secured, these had to be passed to OPW uh, for our Section 47 exemption for each of the specific sites. Um, and these had to be ratified by JER prior to any works taking place on site. With the, the location and the types of dams confirmed, what we did then was we marked up the dams on the ground using small wooden stakes uh, and some lane marker, which we tried to discreetly spray onto an adjacent fence post or a rock. Uh, we also recorded the grid coordinates of the dams. Um, so you can see on the left there, the maps that we produced showing the type of dam, the site location uh, in reference to the Clawmany area itself, and then the position of each of the dams along the watercourse, uh, as well as the maps. Then we produced uh, the detailed drawing, as you can see on the right there, of the three different types of dam to allow the contractor to actually build the dams. Jessica Devlin was appointed by the Anishon Rivers Trust as an ecologist. Uh, Jessica undertook a baseline ecological assessment, produced some maps as shown on the slide there of each of our sites before any construction works took place. Uh, within two 
of the proposed sites, Jessica observed the presence of otters and otters are protected under the Wildlife Act. So on Jessica's recommendation, we relocated uh, a couple of the proposed leaky wooden dams or we removed them from the project. Uh, we also advised the contractor to remain vigilant for any other activity, uh, you know, runs or sprint. And thankfully, Jessica recorded no invasive species at any of our selected sites. Construction of the dams then. Uh, the contractor was appointed directly by the Manitoba Rivers Trust. The appointed contractor was NH Forestry, uh, who's worked with the trust before and has an understanding of environmental construction techniques for river restoration works. Early in the construction phase, uh, the contractor developed what became known as the push and drop technique. Uh, where ground conditions on the banks allowed. So what this is, was a narrow trench was excavated on the near side of the bank and then tipped logs, or basically just pointing one end of the log, were pushed into the far side of the bank in between the strainer posts and then dropped back down into the excavation on the near side. The advantage of this was to Reduce the sediment pollution risk to the waters by reducing the volume of ex excavation. Access to all of our sites was via adjacent agricultural lands. You can see the photograph on the right there. Uh, dedicated construction corridors were confirmed with landowners as part of our lands agreements. Construction took place uh, during the summer months which was advantageous as this meant uh, works were taking place in the water courses when there was a lower flow. Uh, this also helped to reduce any potential damage to land within our agreed construction corridors. And it also gave the sods a chance to reestablish themselves following the excavation. Uh, you can see the picture on the left there, the the sods that were removed prior to construction reinstated on the right hand side. In total, we managed to build 65 dams across 11 different sites in the Ballyhallen and Bukharni catchments. The costs uh, for the log type dam there, uh, that's the type on the left. Uh, these were constructed at around uh, 568 euro per dam. The boarded type dam was constructed for about 384 euro. However, it's worth noting that these dams were constructed with the help of owners trust volunteers as engagement and involvement with the community was a stipulation of funding provided to the trust. And then the natural type dams were constructed at around 150 euros each. That's just uh, labor costs as there was no material costs involved to that. Uh, so once we'd uh, finished the construction phase, we provided the trust with um, a maintenance schedule. You can see a snap of that on the top left of the slide. Uh, this checklist for the leaky dams allows the maintenance works to be done by the trust themselves. This includes clearing debris from the dam, uh, small branches and other detritus can block up the dams, reducing the leakiness of the dam. So it's important to maintain that. Uh, Trust will have to carry out a condition survey by checking all the elements of the dam for signs of rot or loss of section. To inspect the integrity of the structure, so making sure that the drainer posts are still true and secure, that 
none of the boards or logs have become loose. Um, we noticed that uh, erosion was found to be an important issue to monitor. Uh, the picture at the bottom of the slide there is of one of our dams on the main Valley Helen River itself. Uh, after a high level event shortly following the dam's construction, uh, a significant portion of the downstream bank was eroded away by the high level waters. The Inishone Rivers Trust themselves repaired this erosion using the small brash revetments, as you can see in the photograph, and this will help to prevent any further erosion and allow the bank to re-establish itself. It's worthwhile notice, noting that the banks on the Ballyhallion at our site were found to be, there was a lot of large boulders and stones. Um, so we think because we couldn't use the push and drop technique here, we, well, we're surmised that this was the cause of the erosion was the extra over excavation to allow the um, installation of the dam and short time period between the dam being constructed and uh, the high level event. So at the end of the dam's life, um, the guidance says that the typical lifespan of a, a leaky wooden dam is anywhere from five to 10 years. This is dependent on how often the high level events bring the dam into action, um, the climate in the local environment, how harsh uh, an environment the, the, the logs are subjected to. Uh, but at the end of that, say, 10 year period, the trust has three options open to them. They can choose to leave the structure in stream, provided that it's not at immediate risk of uh, blowout, but, you know, damaging or blocking any downstream culverts, bridges, or even uh, a downstream dam. They can choose to replace the leaky wooden dam itself, or they can just simply decide to remove it. Uh, you can see there the factor on the slide is of the same river as the previous slide. So that's the Bally. Hallen River, and that's the dam in action shortly after the construction during one of our summer storms. Uh, the lessons learned then from this project, uh, as this was a first of its kind project in Ireland, we wanted to identify which aspects of the project we got right uh, and which of the which aspects need more consideration or going forward, hopefully um, more of this type of project across the island, what needs more consideration. Um, landowner engagement is critical because everything hinges on their buy-in. Um, would allow for additional lead-in time uh, for this engagement process. I repeat myself again, but you know, because of COVID restrictions, we couldn't get out as early as we wanted to to get talking to, you know, the riparian landowners, the guys that farmed adjacent to the Ballyhallen and the Kearney Rivers. Uh, time taken to get people on board, I think, was underestimated. Um, I heard multiple visits, um, just to get chatting to them, to listen to their concerns, to address those concerns. But what we did learn was that on completion of the project, the riparian landowners were happy with the measures that uh, they saw constructed. Um, and we got uh, really positive feedback from not just the landowners where we did construct dams, but other guys who were able to start. Um, again, go, going back to COVID again, uh, 
we had multiple reports that during lockdown, um, when everybody was stuck in the house and you know we were all bored stupid, there was yeah multiple reports that guys were out sort of cleaning out uh, existing field drains and maybe even digging new ones. And again, then this was exacerbating the problem of the sharpening of the hydrograph within the rivers. And again, it's something that the Rivers Trust continues to work with um, the landowners. You know, nobody's got a problem with uh, guys trying to increase the productivity of their lands, but it's just maybe doing it in a more uh, flood sensitive manner. Uh, the commonage lands then that we had identified as having the greatest potential. I think it's definitely worth investigating. Is there some sort of mechanism that could be employed that would allow works to be carried out without having all those landowner permissions in place? Um, it's a huge sink, essentially, that could be employed to store um, floodwaters during those high-level events um, and just give the downstream rivers and, you know, Pamani itself is the confluence of about four or five different rivers, and it would just give that wee bit of breathing space, that wee bit of capacity in the rivers, so that it's not flooding the town itself. The community then, um, new approaches to flood management, I think it's fair to say, are viewed with some skepticism. Uh, the concern from some members of the public was that, you know, a flood scheme is a big concrete wall that's built along the river through the town and it keeps the waters at bay and that's problem solved. But once, you know, definitely from the, the community uh, consultation and the centre, and when you got speaking to people face to face and you explained the catchment wide approach, uh, confidence definitely grew um, and after the first after the installation of the first set of dams um, they definitely understood what it was we were trying to do and the purpose of it so I think it's worth considering going forward with this type of project in Ireland that if you ins could install an early trial measure which if it, you know it could be fast tracked with the local stakeholders and build it as a demonstration site and just as a, you know there's nothing beats actually being able to take somebody to something and point it and say this year's what we're doing the information packets that we had as i said the two meter lidar just didn't extend up into the higher reaches of the catchment um if we had a had higher resolution, you know, the 25 DTM is fairly coarse. It would have saved us some uh, lost time when we were ID and sites and driving around the catchment. During the construction phase, uh, there was a lack of tree cover in the catchment. This reduced the amount of timber of a suitable size to construct the dam. Um, yeah, just the contractor was struggling to actually get his hands on logs of a suitable length. So again, there would advise improved planning for the sourcing of material, um, probably bringing in the contractor at an earlier stage to again, just like the community and the landowners to explain to them what this approach to flood management is and how it works and what it entails. Uh, and again, then the you know the lack of ripple and tree cover meant that the more natural type dam was limited to one site, which you know ideally what you want to be doing is having your managed ripple and tree zone um, adjacent to the water courses, and then in pain being able to use those as dams. That is me. Um, 